Hello, everybody. My name is Jacek Bartoszak. Welcome to Strategy in Future. And tonight with me is Nicholas Myers. Hello, Nick. How are you? Oh, good. Uh, good evening to you. It's been too long since I last got to talk to you. Okay. Uh, he is sitting in Rhode Island, the U.S. Naval War College. But I understand that you will be talking in your own capacity, Nick. Yes, that's the uh, caveat that we need to, to make. Yes, right? I need to say that my views do not represent that of the Naval War College of the U.S. government and are exclusively my own. Sure. So let's uh, let's start with Ukraine, of course, and the, uh, what are the lessons learned learned in terms of strategic implications, given the uh, discourse in the United States and the uh, you know, and and of course the uh, the, the ever emerging China problem of China in U.S. foreign policy. So where are we now? What is your view? We haven't spoke, we haven't talked to each other for a while. I'm very much curious what you think. Where are we? Well, perhaps one of the most interesting dynamics to all this is just how much the war front hasn't moved for the past number of months, despite a whole bunch of headline activities occurring. Um, I think that we really do need to look at this in terms of two sets of lessons right now. There's the straightforward strategic lessons and then how this is being played out in terms of military bureaucracy and tactics. So I'm just checking through my notes, and I, as I see it, even in Russian propaganda, the Russian Ministry of Defense hasn't claimed capturing a single new town in Ukraine, town settlement, or anything, honestly, since the end of February of this year, despite there being uh, supposedly a continuous offensive since sometime in mid-January. So it strikes me immediately, it strikes a number of people, just how little movement there is. On the strategic side, I think that everybody has come away with the conclusion that their basic instincts have been correct so far, uh, which is setting us up for just a very, very long war, which is what I was afraid of right at the beginning. Um, Essentially, the United States and its partners believe that there is, in fact, a way to not get boots on the ground and ultimately force a strategic victory of some form or another. And the Russians are convinced that they can essentially take whatever tactical defeats on the ground are necessary to outlast Western support for Ukraine to the point that either Ukraine will collapse of its own accord or that even if the Russians have been completely defeated, conventionally on the ground, there will be nothing that the West could do to actually stop its, change its policies, uh, because they'll always be afraid to attack Russia itself. And so long as everybody believes that those strategic imperatives or guidance, guidances are correct, I really don't think there is going to be much change to policy on either side. Um, we can take bets as to who's going to fold first or whether or not, but I I suspect the ending is actually going to be with either the Russian or Ukrainian state actually failing to continue to con the operations as opposed to anything decisive on the battlefront. On the operational tactical side, what's really incredible is how little learning there seems to be going on on all sides. The Ukrainians have learned to do proper combined arms offensives on the field, and that is a, the, a, a big deal. But in my opinion, that's the only big deal that has come out so far. So they should be proud of having learned how to do that. But on the Russian side, there's been no innovation whatsoever. We have seen the, the limit of the changes I have seen. Uh, this is only using open sources, is that more types of units are learning more types of tactics that they had already been practicing before the war. So in particular, a, an assault tactic that they had been working on specifically with engineering troops is now being exercised with all types of troops in the Russian armed forces. It's, but it's really minor adjustments like that that have happened. Um, on the Western side, everyone seems to have bought into the fact that just dumping more equipment into this fight is actually going to be the solution to enabling additional combined arms offensives. That may ultimately be the case for this war, but if it is, then where are all of these giant quantities of weapons that we're dumping into it going to come in the future? Uh, what the war has turned into is a giant 20th century clearinghouse of equipment uh, that next time around, we just won't have huge stockpiles of things sitting around that we, people were hoping to use during, well, not hoping, but planning to be used in World War III 
30, 40 years ago, uh, if it's all expended already, then it's going to be quite a different conflict from than what we are seeing. So that logic, I think, functions well enough for this war, but it will have to be reimagined already uh, if there's going to be another conflict in the near future, including if the conflict expands from Russia, Ukraine, or if this transitions into a civil war on either side. The last thing I would say at large is that there's been a lot of analogies pulled out about how this war is similar to World War I for all these trench warfare tactics. I, I think that the actual strategic operational level analogy that's more equivalent here is the U.S. Civil War, uh, which unfortunately puts the, the Ukrainians in the position of the Confederacy in this scenario, which is uh, unfair to the Ukrainians' political position. But if you think about it, the South in the U.S. Civil War just needed to survive. The North needed to actually defeat its army and occupy it for a very long time in order to reintegrate it into the country. Um, the North ultimately succeeds in no small part because it is substantially larger by both population and economy than the South was. But they don't do it by just marching and occupying the entire South during the course of the war. They do this by seeking out and eradicating the South's armed forces and finally convincing political elites that it's impossible to continue to resist. And then subsequently, there's an occupation and finally turns into an accommodation in which the South basically gets to continue separate political systems for over a century later before finally, sometime in the late 20th century, you start to see some sort of uh, full-scale legal integration of the country again. Um, I suspect that Russia, with an economy only about seven times the size of Ukraine's, to judge by pre-war standards, is going to have a substantially harder time defeating Ukraine than the North had defeating the South, and that if they actually wanted to accomplish this, they really do need to stop focusing on territorial holding and focus much more instead on finding ways to destroy the Ukrainian armed forces. But the Russians remain obsessed with they're going to ultimately occupy this country, so they don't want to destroy all of the infrastructure. They mostly just wanted to moralize the civilians to believe that there was an alternative path to political life. That is a long answer, but those are the most important implications that I've observed so far. Yeah, uh, what, what will you tell us about the, the, the broader picture of uh, great power competition in Eurasia, the role of China, all those uh, you know pilgrimages of German and French ministers to China, and meetings of Sullivan with the Chinese counterparts, uh, missions of uh, Chinese representatives in the CE region in Europe, and also sending uh, uh, for Chinese foreign minister to Germany and France, and all together, and, and, and you know, and sort of the uh, being a midwife of the peace process. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking about about the Chinese factor here, and also uh, you know the, the policy of sanctions. Um, you know, when I'm reading the uh, interwar period, Article 16 of the League of Nations imposing on on Italy, and the fear that the, the, the you know the, the, the Germany will be also imposed sanctions, pushed pushed for uh, continental integration. How do you see all those things playing playing uh, this time around? Whether we are having a scalable world war already at our hands because of the economic sanctions against Russia and China, or Chinese are just trying to save globalization and playing the European game to sort of uh, uh, cleave cleavage, yeah, the, uh, the the European and U.S. interests. What, what what will we say us about about it? Well. It's Quite a huge question there, Yasek. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, several local. different parts. So I think of the last conversations we had before, uh, I was mentioning that if China suddenly perceives that it was losing money on the international trade scene because they were being rooted into the sanctions regime being placed against the Russians, then we were seriously on a countdown to World War III. <laughs> say again, say again, so that I and audience could understand well. Uh, the logic. This is this is a hypothetical which I'm about to say did not come to pass when I was fearing it in our last conversation sometime last year. Yeah. If Beijing perceived that they were going to be losing money in the international trade system, then we were really going to be on a countdown of probably six months or so to World War III. Mm -hmm. This has not happened to this point. 
for a number of reasons. Um, China has not been included in most of the sanctions regimes, at least not yet. Uh, China has also not been an especially egregious supporter of the Russian war effort, uh, at least not yet, whereas countries like Iran and North Korea have been. Um, this does firstly raise questions about how does Beijing perceive itself in the world. I, I think my personal view on this over the past year has been that China is probably substantially less confident in its ability to uh, win a confrontation with the rest of the world than perhaps was, than I may have feared a year ago. Um, I don't know that that's, I, I, I wouldn't remain confident of that in the long term. Uh, but it certainly seems that China does not perceive itself as needing to remake the international uh, order in the short term. Um, perhaps the best exhibit of this is when Xi Jinping visited Moscow shortly after getting his third term. Uh, Putin came out very adamantly in their first meeting saying, oh, we're looking forward to uh, helping the Chinese establish the RMB currency as the new global reserve currency. And Xi Jinping had nothing to say about that in particular, but in subsequent speeches that Putin gave about how the meetings went and how it all went wonderfully from his perspective, this, this particular topic was completely dropped. Uh, the final set of agreements they put out included some deals on how to do de-dollarization of the uh, trade, which was something that they were already looking into in the final meeting they had before the uh, operation was launched against Ukraine. You may remember the very short-lived agreement to do um, trade in uh, gas but from Siberia to China in euros instead of dollars, uh, which was abruptly terminated when it became clear that uh, Russia didn't have access to euros anymore. But they, they had been attempting to do that for some time. If China wants to start challenging the international order, it's quite clear that Russia and Iran are impatient to help it get started. But, <laughs> excuse me. but it appears that China does not have the confidence to do that at the moment. Um, I don't know precisely where to look for in terms of what would be the indicator that that's starting to change. I suspect that the Chinese will deliberately keep that obscure. But that does mean that the Europeans are increasing their dialogue with the Chinese specifically because, or at least, um, it's possible because unlike the Russians who are content to dig themselves into a trench, not negotiate over anything right now, the Chinese do have quite a lot to lose in their own perspective if they suddenly lose access to international markets. So that Europeans perceive that they have some leverage to get the Chinese to put a uh, definitive limit to how much Russia can continue its war against Ukraine. I don't think the Chinese actually have as much influence over the Russians to do this as most believe. I don't believe that Russia is a junior partner to China in some sort of alliance. Uh, if they is a jun if they are the junior partner in this alliance uh, with China, then China doesn't know it's in an alliance with Russia, in my perspective. Again, all of that may change, um, but the Chinese, I think, quite. I think the Chinese are still addicted to the possibility that they can enrich the world around them sufficiently to dilute Western power out of being relevant to constraining it, as opposed to actually, <coughs> as opposed to having to actually challenge uh, Western hegemony inside of Asia. Taiwan's probably the major exception to this, but even there. I'm not sure what the timeline they're still working with is. So that's one macro section to this. Um, in terms of how the sanctions could literally function, the difficulty is that most Western countries don't actually have things that the Chinese are dependent upon other than literal cash uh, to withhold if they were to start a sanctions regime. Um, unlike with Russia, where it's very much a case of we can find energy elsewhere, either from America or the Middle East, and then we just cut off one major import, and then we can essentially cut off all trade with Russia, or at least the vast majority of it. 
<clears throat> with China, the trade is so um, the, the the trade is so multi multivarious that and import dependent from the European and American perspective that there's a certain limit to how much you can harm them besides just cutting off additional income flows in there. And when that happens, that just incentivizes China to go to war. And then China gets to decide what it's attacking. There are slight exceptions to this. (laughs) The exceptions I have found in my research are Australia, Argentina, and Brazil. What's special about these three places is that they export to China things that China requires in order to be the manufacturing center of the world, Uh, specific types of metals and especially food. If these three places can actually be convinced to join a Western sanctions blockade against China, that is really going to cause some a severe headache that would potentially crash uh, the Chinese international position. Argentina, Brazil, and, and Australia. Australia. Uh, I don't think it's quite like I don't think it's likely that you'd be able to get those three countries on board without the Chinese clearly demonstrating themselves to be in the wrong about something in the international community. But that is where I think the actual leverage lies, and part of why the Chinese went to great lengths to maintain consular and business ties with Australia, even as they had pretty major disputes with the previous government. Um, whereas with other countries that have been unfriendly towards China recently, like such as Canada, they really just started becoming more and more obnoxious as opposed to trying to sort out a way to maintain uh, local ties. Mm-hmm. Those are, I think, the two biggest components to how China fits into the current conflict. In terms of how it might yet still expand, my suspicion is still that if we were to enter the dark world in which China is going to actively back Russia or take a side of on the anti-Western revisionist world, um, it probably would be a very separate campaign to what the Russians are doing in Taiwan which may be all the Russians need, which is why I suspect that Russians are not being especially peaceful on that front at the moment. But uh, it's probably too early to tell since the transition towards that sort of dark world will require specific events to happen. We don't know what specific events those would be. Mm -hmm. And how do you see European uh, powers, Germany and France, behaving in this environment? It's been difficult to get a firm read on what these countries perceive themselves as accomplishing. The most important dynamic that's observable is the ongoing intra-European disputes about what is the nature of the European Union going forward among them. Um, I it, It's... It's honestly something I have not paid sufficient attention to to say with much more granularity than that, though it would one would expect that they would approve of additional stabilization factors along the periphery of Europe, especially the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, but one hasn't seen them changing their policies too dramatically in those places. Uh I mean, the French have been forced out of Africa in a number of spots, allowing the Russians to seep in, which probably got them unhappy, but it has not visibly brought pressure upon them. Uh, Similarly, they might see that having additional leverage in China is perhaps the only thing that's going to potentially give them some form of additional guarantee, not even guarantee, but additional leverage over the security of Central and Eastern Europe, since they don't have the military resources uh, or, uh, or let's say, strategic willingness to take on a nuclear armed power uh, with conventional forces directly. So there's certainly an, a, a plausible investment in them seeking additional security in the Middle East and North Africa, as well as trying to use China as a bulwark against Russia. But What has been most notable is that they've really just subordinated themselves to U.S. policy in a way that uh, previous U.S. administrations would be quite happy with. So 
uh, I think the, the the degree to which they believe they have autonomy in this current situation is actually remarkably limited. Hmm. So the last question, Nick. So what are the prospects of the Third World War now? <coughs> oh boy, excuse me. Uh, for the moment, I'm less worried now than I was um, last year. But that is overwhelmingly being driven by the fact that it appears Beijing is not actively seeking reasons to get involved in the fight. And if anything seems to be and not willing to rein the Russians in because I don't think they want to use their leverage to do that, uh, but not willing to give them the ability to win this fight either. I still suspect, though, that the resolution of the Russia-Ukraine conflict is going to be a five- to seven-year process of actual kinetic fighting. So we're only one year in. That's a long time for things, for strange things to happen especially since in wartime, international politics changes much more rapidly and dramatically than it would, uh, d- than it ever does during peacetime. So I would say the risks of things being, ch- the risks of things changing are quite high at the moment, but that the trajectory we are on is toward keeping things localized. But what, what I would say is a much more worrying prospect is either all of Ukraine becoming essentially a failed state that either the Russians are not able to occupy or the Europeans aren't able to integrate or the Russians having their own state collapse and then we need to seriously figure out how to balance what is a sovereign decision out there with how do we secure a whole bunch of weapons, especially nuclear weapons, that uh, we don't necessarily understand uh, what their chain of command is at any given moment. Those, I think, are the much more worrisome scenarios that seem likely. Uh, but if I had to put a number on it, I'd say uh, the odds of World War III breaking out from this conflict have probably declined to only about 5 to 10 percent, whereas I would have put them at more like 20, 25 percent six months ago. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, Nick, thank you very much. Uh, our guest today was Nicholas Myers. Uh, thank you, Nick, uh, again. And uh, We'll see how it all develops. We are quite worried. More happily than what I said. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you. Have a good evening.